Yes, I am black. <laughs> and that's for those of you that were not entirely sure. Actually, that's the beauty of our culture and race, right? We come in all shapes and sizes and skin tones and hair textures, right? Lots of options out there, brothers and sisters. No need to stray. Think about that. Anyway, I always say that before I speak because if you do, do not know <clears throat> my cultural orientation, you probably will be offended by what I say. We're going to have a very frank and open discussion. My goal is very simple. It is to try to convince you to join us June 25th in your own backyard where we have moved one of the best conferences in black America, just recently selected by Forbes magazine as one of the top five conferences not to miss in America. Not one of the top five black conferences not to miss, but one of the top five conferences in America. You know how many conferences there are in America? We are the first and only African American conference to achieve that recognition. So I'm going to try to convince you to get in your car unlike 98% of the people that will be here <clears throat> and drive on down to the Fairmont Hotel and join us for 96 hours of the most riveting, the most <clears throat> rich, the most awe-inspiring training and teaching that you will receive. It's, imp it's important that you do this this year because this is our final year in Dallas and you know we have been here four years this is our fourth year we committed to three and we stayed an extra year because this is a wonderful place to be a lot a lot, lot of wonderful people so we stayed an extra year and then we will be moving the conference from Dallas uh, to Washington DC Prince George's County. How many of you heard of Prince George's County, Washington, D.C.? You probably have relatives there. It's the richest black county in America. Average annual income for brothers and sisters in Prince George's County is close to $80,000 a year. Average. Average. So that's where we will be going. Um, Cliff could not make it this morning. Uh, he is uh, working earning a living. He sends his love and we love him for charting a good and righteous course and staying the course with the empowerment series. That's number one. Number two, I cannot say enough about Erwin Ashford with Comerica. We had a wonderful dinner last night with Cliff and, and um, very rich discussion so I want to thank him for putting his money where his mouth is and being of the kind of consciousness that <clears throat> serves us well um, in the public and private sector. So those are sort of my opening remarks and so I always do uh, a short let's call it internal prayer for me. And I simply would like for you to know that I am asking God to grant me the words to speak your thoughts. May he grant me the words to speak your thoughts. Um, where do we begin? We begin in this great country. This is a great country. I travel about 350,000 miles a year. I have about eight and a half million frequent fly miles. Over the last 18 months, I've been in 187 different cities around the country and around the world. And if you have traveled as extensively as I have traveled, you will understand that this is the greatest country in the world. There, there are no black people in the entire world doing better than we are. 
and I've traveled every place that black people have been dispersed. I've been to South Africa, East Africa, Central Africa, West Africa, all over North Africa, and all over South America, and all over the Caribbean. That's where we were dispersed. And there are no black people in the entire world doing better than we are. In fact, they're all trying to get here. So we know <clears throat> that <clears throat> we are the beacon of hope. Africans in America. We are the beacon of hope for every single person of African descent in the entire world. They're all looking at us. And we know because we are morally grounded and spiritually rooted, two things. That to whom much is given, much is required. We have an awesome responsibility not only to save ourselves, but to be the model for all people of African descent throughout the entire world. They are looking to us. They're saying, what are black folks in America doing? What are they singing? What are they marching about? What are they aspiring to? They are thinking that and saying that, I promise you. Now, in the context of what I'm going to be saying to you, uh, this morning, uh, there are three things. One, I cannot say all that I really would like to say within the constraints of the time that I have. So we're going to make this a two-part presentation. I'm going to give you the first sort of macro part right now. If I'm ever invited back by Clifton and Irwin, I'll give you part two. It's just too much to say, too little time to say it. I'm going to try to get it done within about 60 minutes so that I can leave time for Q&A because it is a pro provocative proposition that I'm going to be laying on the table for you. And I want you, I want to get your feedback and I want to um, understand where you're coming from and what you think are the needs of our people in the 21st century. Uh, so I promise you that. The second thing I promise you is that I will not be saying anything you haven't heard before, except this morning you're going to hear it differently, understanding that everything happens for a reason and serves us in some special way, and you will never understand that reason looking forward, and you will only understand it looking backwards. The great Swiss psychologist Carl Jung, J-U-N-G, called this phenomenon synchronicity the seemingly accidental intermeshing of meaningless circumstances. And what he discovered in his life's work is that there are no meaningless circumstances. That everything happens for a reason. Right? So you are sitting here for a reason at this moment in time. Everybody in Dallas that looks like us was invited. You selected to take your time and your, uh, and your treasure and to park it here this morning. So, whomever is sitting next to you is supposed to be sitting next to you. And if there's an empty seat next to you, it's supposed to be empty. <laughs> Understanding that when the students are ready, the teachers will appear, not one minute late and not one minute early. You are always where you're supposed to be. And today, you selected few of the masses of, of us in Dallas have decided to be here. Um, I never give a talk without grounding it in a couple of passages, or I call them my pillars, uh, from the Bible. We are spiritual people. We are the most morally grounded and spiritually rooted people in America. We're going to put a pin in that and I'm going to demonstrate to you why that is profoundly true. And um, so I want to give you a couple of passages from which I will ground my talk. The first is Proverbs 27, 21. The crucible is for silver, but the furnace is for gold. The crucible is for silver, but the furnace is for gold. Number two, passage number 
2, Ecclesiastics 10, 19. Money answers all things. The mother's milk of all intentions is money. Money is the mother's milk of all intentions. And without money, all you have is a good damn intention. But you will not get anything done in America without money. At the end of the day, when we finish pontificating ad nauseum, about our issues, somebody's got to write a check. Our Jewish brothers and sisters can write a check. Our Asian brothers and sisters can write a check. Our East Indian brothers and sisters who control the hotel motel industry in America in the last 30 years without your permission, or Jesse's permission, or Al Sharpton's permission, can write a check. Our Arab brothers and sisters, and I was in Abu Dhabi and Dubai, can write a check. Oh, they can write serious checks. <laughs> serious checks. If you ever been to Abu Dhabi or Dubai, uh, it's stupid money. Stupid, <laughs> just like stupid money. We can't write a check. And therein lies, at the core, in spite of the fact that we're a 1.1 trillion dollar annual economy, that's what we are. If we were a nation, we would be the 16th richest nation in the entire world. But our money goes in one direction away from us and we're some of America's most conspicuous consumers. We've taken the art of consumption to a whole new level. We do not produce anything that we buy and we do not sell anything that we purchase. We are the consumption machines of America. And when you're consuming and not producing, at the end of the day, you can't write a check. You cannot finance your own revolution. You cannot use money to assuage the deeper issues within the context of our own community. We must fix this in the 21st century. The third and final passage I want to ground my talk in is a not often quoted passage. It is a direct quote from Jesus Christ. And there are not many direct quotes from Jesus Christ in the Bible. John 5.30. Check it out when you get home. And Jesus said, I of my own self can do nothing. Now this was Jesus. Jesus couldn't get it done on his own by himself in a vacuum. So what's up with you? Why would you think you could do anything significant, anything worth talking about, anything that is sustainable on your own by yourself in a vacuum? The fact of the matter is, brothers and sisters, you cannot. This passage says to me that we were born to network that we were born to work with and through each other, that we were born to collaborate. But we have not learned this lesson. Because God has given us everything we need to succeed. We have everything we need to succeed in this great country except each other. Jews have each other. Asians have each other. East Indians have each other. Arabs have each other. We don't have each other. So God asked me to say to you on my trip here yesterday, while I was 35,000 feet in the air, he said, George, I want you to tell my black friends in Dallas at the library tomorrow morning that I ain't giving them anything else. God will not be giving black people anything else. What will we do with it? Until we demonstrate to God that we can be better stewards of that which we already have. And when we can demonstrate to God that we can be better stewards of that which we already have, we will also demonstrate to ourselves 
and most importantly, demonstrate to the world that we are a force to be reckoned with. So with all this money and all these resources, we are not a force. We have, you heard me say it, we have every single thing we need except each other. $1.1 trillion annual economy. 16th richest nation in the entire world. You could take the overwhelming majority of countries in sub-Saharan Africa, combine their gross domestic product, and it would not equal the $1.1 trillion that we bring to the table in a single year. We have brain power. We're brilliant people. Most of us have forgotten who they really are, but we are brilliant. We have surpassed W.E.B. Du Bois' dream. You remember his 90-year-old dream of the talented 10th? His dream was if at least 10% of black people could get the finest education possible, he meant a college education. They would then get that education, they would then come back to their community, they would reinvest in their community, and that 10% alone would uplift the entire race. That was Du Bois' dream. We've surpassed that dream. 18% of black folks in America, nine, uh, yeah, yeah, 18%, uh, 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 that's an 80% almost doubling of what uh, Dr. Du Bois wanted for us, right? 18% of black folks in America have at least a four-year college degree or better. So let me say that another way. We have a lot of PhDs in our community. We now need some PhDs, right? We need some PhDs. So we are brilliant people. And here's an interesting statistic you don't hear very often. 60% of the black workforce, nearly 9 million of us, are in executive, managerial, supervisory, professional specialty, vocational, technical, administrative sales, and business ownership positions. That is an army of potential role models and mentors to help those who are stuck in the cycle of poverty. In fact, there is no army in the entire world larger than the army of black people that have succeeded in this country. So make no mistake about it, success runs in our race. But the question is, what are we doing with this? What is the state of mind of black America? If Dr. King were to come back here today, 50 years after his death, he would be ecstatic that Barack Hussein Obama is president. He predicted it. He predicted there would be a black president within 40 years. But he would be angry with black people about every single thing else. He would just simply look at black people <laughs> and say, is this what I took a bullet for? Is this what I took? We're at the bottom of every single statistic that matters in America. And we came over here on the Mayflower for the 35th year in a row. We're at the bottom of the SAT scores for the 35th year in a row. Asians are now at the top. They have replaced white males and white females. And I don't even want to get into the statistics. You know what the statistics are. And we ought to be ashamed of ourselves. There was an interesting article on the front page of USA Today not long ago. I hope you saw it. It was on the front page below the fold. It was about, Af it was about black people and their money. Baby boomers. My generation. The most read newspaper in the United States, USA Today, about black people and their money. Here's what they said. They said that baby boomers, black baby boomers, will be the first generation of Africans in America to raise another generation of Africans in America that will not do better than them. So in the 400-year history of our people, we are the only generation to raise another generation that will be worse off. So A, we need our asses kicked. B, you can count me out of that. I will not be a part of that equation. And you must not be a part of that equation. We ought to be ashamed of ourselves. We cannot allow that to happen on our watch. It's never happened in the history of Africans in America except for us. So as the brothers in the hood would say, what's up with that? That's insanity. We are a magnificent and beautiful people, but most of us have forgotten who they really are. I'm writing a new book. It will not be out for a year. It'll be introduced at next year's conference called The Black Manifesto. The Black Manifesto. It's really marching orders for black people 
a new consciousness and a new mindset for black people for the 21st century. But in the book, I start with these words. And I'm going to read them to you because I have not committed them to memory. I believe that African Americans are at a pivotal point in history. The world is not waiting for us to wake up to our power. It's time for African Americans to take a seat at the table, not only in America, but also in the global economy. And unfortunately, we continue to place our power in the hands of those who have historically oppressed us, and even worse, we continue to oppress each other. This is the meaning of internalized oppression to continue to fall into the cultural hypnosis of thinking that white America controls our lives is a true abdication of our personal power. The reality is, is that each and every day is an opportunity to create a new and powerful story in our culture and unless we find a way to write this new story and to claim our power there will be devastating implications for our community and for the world. In other words, there is no one to save us but us. The fantastic news is that as people of African descent, we possess enormous untapped creativity and potential and as individuals and as a collective network. And once we fully tap into what makes us tick, what unleashes performance in our culture, we will assume our rightful place on the global stage. We don't know what makes us tick. We're struggling with that. What makes us tick at its core is to understand how beautiful, how magnificent, how powerful you, you are to take advantage of endless possibilities. That's what's missing. We need a new mindset and a new consciousness in the context of our people. That we need to infuse into them their history. Because our history has been limited to the 400 years that we've been here. Well, we have a much greater history than that. In case no one has ever told you that we are the children of the slaves that would not die, that we have the genetic encoding, though, of the great kings and queens of Africa, that we were building pyramids and solving complex engineering problems when other cultures were living in huts eating each other. Really. And in spite of the fact that America kept its foot on our throat for 350 years, we overcame that and we rose like the phoenix. We are an awesome and powerful people. We are gods first people. Now that's not hype. That's not exaggeration. That's science. The first human remains, humans as we know them, were found in the Olduvai Gorge in Ethiopia. If you're hanging out in Ethiopia, you're blue-black. Right? And we ruled the earth for 35,000 years. Now let me give you some information. White people did not appear on earth until 40,000 years later. Not two years later, six years later, 10 years later, but 40,000 years later, white people appeared. They began migrating out of Africa, a change of phenotype, change of skin color, and you know, white people. Surely we are not going to blow a 35,000 year head start. <laughs> right? So this little bump, little setback called slavery, the most egregious system of slavery ever invented by man, is not going to deter us. Racism, white supremacy, White skin privilege, white superiority is not going to deter us. That we are going to succeed in spite of racism. 
just as our president succeeded in spite of racism. He su succeeded in spite of white skin privilege. He succeeded in spite of white, of, of white superiority. He succeeded in spite of the fact that half of the Congress wished that he would just simply go away, that they wanted their country back. But he succeeded in spite of that. And we all can, and we must, and we will. That we are powerful people and we need to understand our history. And as I said earlier, in spite of the fact that America kept its foot on our throat, really, for 350 years, we overcame that and we rose like the phoenix. I mean, think about the state of oppression that we were in. But we still rose. We still overcame. So if everything happens for a reason and serves us in some special way and we will never understand that reason looking forward and we will only understand it looking backwards, I said that earlier, remember? Maybe we were not brought here. Maybe we were sent here. Do you believe that God would put his weakest people here to do his toughest job? I don't think so. How could an America who could morally, spiritually, and biblically justify the kidnapping, raping, and pillaging of another two people, natives already in America, and Africans brought to 